Thank you very much, Jim, for helping me transition into a completely different set of ideas. I'd like to thank you and Mark for organizing this and inviting me. It's really a privilege to come share ideas around sustainability. One of the things we talked about at lunch is just how poorly defined sustainability as a term is. So I'm going to start out uh, by setting some context, talking about um, what sustainability means. I am in the first school of sustainability in the United States. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. We're still finding our way, desperately seeking to understand what this means. My colleagues and I have been working on this for 20 years, and um, we just uh, wrote a paper that will appear this year, again trying to deal with, with this, uh, 20 years after Jack Pezzi wrote his uh, first articles on what sustainability should mean in terms of an economic model. Different interpretations in different contexts from the sustainability imperative, uh, capturing the eco-premium in the business world, which is kind of a cynical view, to uh, sustainability as fairness. All that really matters is, is uh, procedural justice. <clears throat> However, that doesn't really get you very far. So the working definition that we're kind of using is that uh, it's based on two things. Complex social technical systems are deeply related to problem solving. In contrast to another view that uh, when societies become efficient, they can generate a surplus, which then allows smart people and priests to emerge and generate new ideas. The flip of that is no society solved with complex problems to solve generates innovation uh, and change to solve those problems. So problem solving, in fact, is a decision problem, problem about resource allocation. We heard a lot from Peter about that. How do we allocate resources to this problem? It's a decision problem. And of course, there's a massive uh, toolbox out there for um, <clears throat> uh, working in, uh, on decision making problems. So we think of sustainability as a particular choice of a decision-making framework where the performance measure involves intra, intergenerational, and interspecies equity. So any decision framework you choose, you have to define what your performance measure is. What are you looking to solve, right? You have to define that up front. For us, sustainability involves those three things. <clears throat> the next thing is, is what's your decision-making framework? Are you building a dreamliner? Are you building a new power plant? Or are you trying to design some kind of collective process by which society is going to make decisions. Okay? You have to define your decision-making context. The, the sustainab sustainability decision framework involves contexts where collective action problems, complex group decision-making are essential because all of the things that we face in terms of sustainability problems involves collective decision-making. My, my welfare depends on your choices and your choices which then depend on my choices. So we're all hooked up in this collective action uh, dilemma. Finally, um, although anybody who builds a complex thing, and one of my colleagues here, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, he's an electrical engineer, does robust control, says, yeah, we face a lot of uncertainty too, and we build a hypersonic jet, you know, or hi hypersonic uh, vehicle. Lots of problems where when you reach certain speeds, the temperatures go up, and the material of the aircraft starts to change shape. That makes the aerodynamics really hard. But on the other hand, at least you can bound the system reasonably well and work on it. In, in the sustainability context, uncertainty, nonlinearity, and feedback are ubiquitous. We really just don't know very much about the system that we're working with. I really want to emphasize here, though, when, when I talk about control, for those in the audience who get upset when you talk about control in terms of social systems, I don't mean control in that somebody's controlling the system. All I mean is the following. <clears throat> All I mean is there's some kind of complex uh, dynamical system here, up here, that you can measure something about. Then based on what you measure, you have a decision-making process, whether it's a democratic uh, government, a dictatorship, a small group of villagers who are irrigating, a small fishery, a large fishery, whatever it is, you have some group who can then take those measurements and make some sort of decision, then develop a policy, which is just a feedback. It's something that you do. And that involves allocating resources. You allocate your time to fishing over there. You allocate your time to cultivating over there. It's, an, it's a resource allocation problem. So this generates uh, a feedback system. And of course, uh, here, I reemphasize that sustain sustainability is the study of this thing where there's a particular choice of performance measures for evaluating options. Now, we've heard a little bit about emergence. And it's one of my favorite things as a person who does dynamical systems. And 
This kind of feedback loop generates an adaptive, path-dependent, self-organizing process where built infrastructure and natural systems co-develop. In the sense that this, this is not pre-designed. It's not as though someone sits down and pre-designs this decision-making process for this complex dynamical system. In reality, we are continually learning about the, the complex dynamical system, reinventing the decision processes along the way, and then this, this feedback system uh, evolves and self-organizes uh, in an evolutionary sense. <clears throat> Got to get my directions right here. So, <clears throat> um, we, uh, I think there's some electrical engineers in the room. I don't know if you do feedback control. but. Um, for uh, feedback systems, there are some basic fundamental properties, and those fundamental properties involve um, robustness, fragility, trade-offs. Feedback is incredibly powerful. It enables us to do amazing things that we couldn't do otherwise if we were trying to control things in some open loop way where we kind of measure something and then do something by clock time. Feedback enables us to do amazing things, to tune what we do to the environment around us. But if you use feedback, to reduce variability in your system, you can reduce sensitivity here. This picture shows how you reduce, you can reduce sensitivity to some frequency of disturbance, but there's this push-pop phenomenon. So if you become robust to this, these low frequency disturbances, you necessarily become fragile to higher frequency disturbances. So then you can say, okay, we really want to be robust to a certain kind of uncertainty. So the green curve shows you, you change your controller a bit. You really want to crush the variability for these low frequency disturbances and guess what the mass gets even higher up here so you've got this conservation of fragility which uh, has, is referred to for at least linear systems as Bode's law. <clears throat> so what we try to do is um, apply these ideas to social ecological systems where you have a complex ecology whether it's a fishery, forestry, irrigation system, <clears throat> whatever, the, whatever the resource is and try to understand how the decisions people make, make them robust to some kinds of disturbances, but then introduce fragilities to other kinds of disturbances. And I'm going to try to link that back to your talk, um, because what we do affects what these people who are involved with these small-scale systems do. <clears throat> most of this literature, whoops, sorry, most of the literature here in um, robust control is expressed in the frequency domain. And I work on dynamical systems, so I always like to think in the time domain. So for my own edification, or for yours, uh, I've included a time domain picture here of what's going on with these robustness, fragility trade-offs. Suppose you have an agriculturalist who's faced with interannual variation in the weather, and they don't want to make too many, they don't want to make, they don't want their output to be too high in a year because then they can't store it, they can't take care of it. I work on a lot of uh, prehistoric systems where you can't just make food and transform it and store it. So you don't want to make too much when things are good. But on the other hand, you don't want to make too little when things are not, uh, you don't want to make too little when things are not so good. So you have a, you have a signal here. <clears throat> you have a signal, an environmental signal here, this red signal. And you can build a little feedback loop and the agriculturalist can adjust the amount of land they cultivate based on a simple feedback of what their, their yield was the year before. Very simple feedback. And you can then um, crush this variation and try to drive your output to this constant. If there's any feedback system on this planet that is ubiquitous, it's irrigation. What does irrigation do? It crushes interannual variation in food supply by building massive infrastructure. It's essentially a giant capacitor, right? That's what all the irrigation infrastructure is. So this is wonderful <clears throat> if you, uh, and I'm just going to show you two examples with a gain of 5 and a gain of 10, which is just how fast you respond. With a gain of 10, of course, you can crank the gain up, and you can, you can smash the variation very effectively. But suppose for a short time your frequency of environmental disturbance changes. So here's the push-pop. If your gain is 5, you'll see that you're doing fine here, but during this period with higher frequency disturbance, no difference in amplitude, just frequency, you get this, this wild fluctuation. If you crank your... Um, your gain up even higher, you get even wilder fluctuations. So you're trading off robustness here, low frequency disturbance for fragility here. So now I'm going to ask you to make a leap of faith, because this stuff is really well defined in linear feedback control systems, but in the systems that we study, not so well defined, but we still use it metaphorically. 
So one of my colleagues, Eleanor Ostrom, who sadly recently passed away, had developed in the political science literature this idea of the IAD framework, which is the Institutional Analysis and Design Framework, to study how people organize their um, social interactions and solve collective action problems. Her main interest was collective action problems. And the idea is, is that you've got some biophysical conditions you're concerned with. You've got the attributes of the community who's trying to solve the problem. And then they have a certain set of rules in use. So this it can easily be thought of as a feedback control. Right? That generates what she called an action situation. We're in an action situation now where people exchange material energy and information somehow. And then they generate an outcome which is evaluated, which is then fed back in the system. So Lynn was very much thinking in terms of feedback systems when she was developing these ideas. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do, in fact, let me back up here, is explore the structure of this part of the system in terms of how it generates feedbacks and how robust those feedbacks are and how fragile those feedback systems are. So what we did in 2004 is developed a kind of structural representation of this, the far side of that diagram that links resource users, people who mainly use the resource. In your example, that's industry and households who use energy. The resource in your case would be energy. In the two cases I'm going to talk about, it's going to be water and land and fisheries. And the resource users <coughs> generate public infrastructure. And we talked a little bit about public infrastructure earlier as the grid. So most societies that benefit from being a society have some sort of shared infrastructure, something that they use together. It's too large. It's require, it's quite, requires too large of a scale for any individual to do it. So they generate public infrastructure, which then mediates the relationship between the resource users and the resource itself. This is just a framework that helps us parse out the pieces. This isn't a theory or a model. It's just a general framework that helps us build a typology of social ecological systems. <coughs> And I want to point out one thing here in that the resource users here and the public infrastructure providers here are not people. They're roles. They're possible positions that people could be in. So if I uh, am in a small irrigation village, in the daytime I'm a farmer. I'm using the resource of water. In the evening or on the weekend, I'm at the water board meeting arguing about how we're going to maintain the canal or how we're going to uh, share the water. So if you're a member of a city council or any, anything that you're doing, you can both be a person living in a neighborhood and also a person working with other people in your neighborhood to preserve some kind of public infrastructure. So to keep that in mind, it's not a division among people. It's a division among possible roles that those people can play. And of course, the big question is, how do exogenous drivers affect the capacity of this system to cope with change? So now I'm going to talk about two examples um, and hopefully convince you that this matters. <clears throat> because often when we talk about this work, especially Eleanor Ostrom's work, she was often criticized that, uh, about the fact that she was studying these small scale systems. It really didn't matter. You know, we've got really big problems. So when I'm working with my colleagues in Thailand and Nepal, I say, convince me that this matters, please. So here's the, here's the story. Small-scale irrigated agriculture consumes 70% of all global developed water supply. So these are going to be some numbers like yours, these big sum numbers, which I think are really important. It produces 40% of global agricultural commodities from 17% of the global cropped area. So it produces a lot of food for a lot of people, 2.4 billion in present numbers, uh, rather efficiently. So it uses a, a, a lot less cropland than, say, dryland agriculture does elsewhere. 90% of the farms worldwide are less than two hectares, like this picture I'm showing here. I'll explain in just a minute, these small households, and this, this would be a field, a couple of fields here, say. Uh, and they, it really does support the majority of the world's poorest people. And the way I think I can connect the kind of work I'm doing to the kind of work you're doing is that our decisions impact these people in the following way. The argument here is that these people that live in these communities, and I'll do two examples, fisheries and this, they are masters at constructing their own robust feedback loops that work extremely well given the, the, the disturbances that they face. The problem is, is based on this I basic ideas from robust control and feedback, they've got to be becoming fragile somehow. So if we want them to go on doing what they do really well, we need to understand how they're becoming fragile. 
And then we have to link that to what we're doing with our energy, our energy and sustainability challenges and how that's going to expose the fragilities that these people face. Because I think that no matter what we do in the developed world, uh, we've got a, a you know, half, the, half the rest of the world is faced with the kind of problems that I'm going to be talking about here. Okay, so now this is a picture of how some climate scientists believe things are going to change in terms of productivity of agriculture. So the more deserty looking, the more that the uh, agricultural productivity is going to go down in the next, say, 50 or 60 years. I think this is by 2080. So you can see that it's a pretty big piece of the planet that's going to have a 15 to 50 percent reduction in agricultural productivity. So things are going to dry out. And not only are they going to dry out, but the pattern, the temporal and spatial patterns of rainfall is going to change as well. Uh, our study sites uh, are in India, Nepal, Thailand, and Colombia, and, and of course in Arizona, uh, which is uh, its own fascinating water story. So the first example I'm going to talk about is an irrigation system in Nepal. Uh, just to give you a sense of just how details are important here, this is a, so a north-south system. So it's running out of the Himalayan foothills. It's steep. You can see here the mountains behind it. The, the way the picture is taken kind of hides how steep this river is, actually, how fast it's flowing. You can see that it's flowing relatively fast. As contrasted with the east-west systems, which are completely different. They're open, long, and that difference in structure generates a completely different feedback system. So we have lots of different examples of how these small-scale SESs have organized over the, the years to help us understand uh, how they function. So. Um, Here's another picture uh, that's a little further downstream. So the big picture in the background shows the river coming in here. There's an intake here, and just behind where this picture was taken is something called a gabion box structure, which is basically a pile of rocks that have been, that have been bound together with a chain link fence that then diverts this flow through this little canal, through that mountain, onto the other side with all sorts of really complex infrastructure that controls not only where the water goes, but what it wears out. This is an example of just how finely tuned the infrastructure is in these systems to local conditions. The next level is to tune this, what I call soft infrastructure. It's the rules that generate the game that the agents play on the combined natural and built infrastructure. Okay, so here's the problem they have to solve. So I worked with an electrical engineer, myself, and a uh, um, political science slash ethnographer who actually did the field work in this location. Here's the Pumper River. This is, this is our engineering schematic of that behind you, the behind the picture thing. The, here's the main headworks that's right here. The water comes in through the mountain. There are six areas that have to be irrigated, and, and of course, they have to divide the water, and the water rights are uh, have seniority in the order these are numbered. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And it's historically set. So here's the fun problem these poor guys have to solve. <coughs> Over the growing season from June to October, during which the monsoons, this is a completely monsoonally driven system, if any of you know this area, monsoonally driven system, they have to keep the depth of water in their paddies uh, in this region here. And here's the water availability. The river goes up during the monsoons. Can anybody guess why it's stopped there? The river goes up. Why is it stopped? They can only get so much water through that thing, right? So then they have this water available. They have all the water in the world when they don't need it. And then, of course, uh, the biggest challenge is to distribute water. Here, about 120 households uh, satisfies the standard uh, metrics. Most are less than two hectares. They're growing rice paddy. And of course, uh, they've got the head gate constraint. And the um, challenge of distributing water. Here's what happens when you don't get it right. This is 2007. Oh, sorry. This is 2007. Beautiful. Paddy's very productive. This is 2008. This is August 4, 2007. August 4, 2008. This is beautiful crop. These are mud pits. This is simply because the monsoons arrive three or four weeks late. The monsoons are regularly uh, uh, arriving late in Pakistan and in India and Thailand, especially in North India, and they're intense. So the average might be the same. You know, some averaging cl climate change scientists might say, oh, you know, it's no problem. But in fact, it's coming three, three or four weeks late. 
which then has a mismatch with the temperatures that are required for the rice to germinate and generates what you see in that bottom picture. So these guys are really, really good at what they do, in fact. <clears throat> so what we did is we built a little model where we would penalize them for a drought. So uh, the drought is the integral of the area outside where you need to be, right? So the, the, the more and the longer you're outside your optimal depth, the more you're penalized, the more your yield is penalized. And of course, the same is true with the flood. So this little black curve shows you a, a possible actual depth profile. And this gray here shows you where you want to be. And this is a blown up version of the first couple of weeks in the previous picture. So we want to see the detail here. So what do they do? Well, it turns out that they have an adaptive feedback control system that's really clever. And they have uh, water delivery coordination. They have open flow sequential rotations, which I'll explain in a minute, 12 and 24 hour clock rotations. Open flow means that all of these main valves, these main head gate structures are open. Plenty of water. Controlling it's, it's not worth it. You don't want to put in the effort to control the water because it's not scarce. Um, <clears throat> Uh, sequential rotation uh, is sequential in, in property rights, so that one gets their water, two gets their water, three gets their water, so on and so forth. 12-hour rotations are one gets 12 hours, two gets 12 hours, three gets 12 hours, so on and so forth, and 24-hour rotations are the same with 24 hours. Doesn't seem like much difference really if you think about it, if again you like do averages or integrals, but in terms of the way the system functions, they're vastly different, and they have vastly different performance uh, outcomes. So what we did is we, we, we built this little model and then we did some robustness analysis. Um, and as you can see, this is why I'm asking you to take a big leap for those of you who actually do robust control. We're, we're using it metaphorically in this case. In the next case, we use it much more uh, uh, in a mathematical sense. But <clears throat> here's what we did. This shows you the, per the percent yield, 100% of course being best, as you reduce the mean river discharge. The green curve shows the open flow strategy. So the farmers, they don't do anything. They just have open flow. They are fine until about 50% of discharge. But then after that, you see they just plummet because then nobody gets enough water. Okay. So the next curves here, the black and the blue, and I don't want to talk about the difference between what we call sequential and optimized sequential. Mathematically, there's not much difference. But in fact, it, it turns out that farmers always optimize these subtle things. Uh, so there's a slight difference, and they do a little bit better. But these sequential rotations help a lot when you run out of water because if you think about it, the, the guy upstream one, if there's not enough water for everybody, but if everybody says, hey, yeah, you take the water, it's pointless for all of us to die, you take the water, and then two gets water, so on and so forth, you can see that you can reduce the sensitivity of the system to a mean river discharge decrease by switching your institutions. These are rules. These are institutions about how water is allocated. So they have an adaptive institutional regime where they shift their institutions based on the water flow. So that's a perfect example of a feedback loop, right? Based on water flow, you switch your control from open flow, you close valves in a different way, these head gate structures, in a different way. So this is very powerful, and guess what? We went back to the field, and this is a wonderful story about the interaction of mathematics with the actual field data, where we had direct contact with people there through our contact. This is, in fact, exactly what they do. This picture shows, and of course, this might seem extreme to you, but these are highly variable systems. One year it might be here, here, here. So they are highly variable, and you do observe the, the small villagers. Again, 120 households, about 500 people, um, making these changes. <clears throat> Notice, 12 and 24 hour uh, policies are always dominated by other policies. So we said to our colleague, when do they do 12 and 24 hours? It, never, it doesn't seem like they'd ever do it. <clears throat> this is the same story for the, the late arrival of the monsoon. So this is just the w river water going down, not as much rain, weaker, ra we weaker monsoons. This is late arrival. So again, up to 20 or 25 days late, they're OK. After that, ouch. And uh, I have colleagues who work with us in Pakistan, and these are devastating when the monsoon arrives late. Notice again that 12 and 24 hour rotations are not particularly useful. So we said, OK, tell us why anybody would ever use 12 and 24 hour rotations. Because our robust control model, or our simple feedback model, says you'd never do it. And he says, you know what, let me contact my colleagues and find out when they actually switch to the 12 and 24 hour rotations. If I had more time, I'd go through the details. And if you guys had more attention, I'd go through the details. But 
I'll just make the, lo the long story short, and it goes as follows. There are two kinds of shocks the system has to face. A shock in the natural infrastructure, the natural world, the river, or a shock to the headgate infrastructure, the human-made infrastructure. Same thing in energy systems will, will obtain. When they get a washout of that headgate infrastructure, which happens uh, all the time because um, of this craziness, let me show you the water, whoops, sorry, don't get sick. Uh, because of this craziness, all right? So you have a year where um, you have um, water here, you're doing fine, but then this goes way higher than usual because the monsoon can also be more intense later in the season. What does that do? It washes your Gabion box structure out and you get no water. So then these guys have to mobilize their labor. This is another second order collective action problem. They have to mobilize labor and fix this as fast as they can. And it turns out that when you have that kind of washout, the 12 and 24 hour rotations uh, work best. So we said, is that what they do? And sure enough, that's what they do. Now, the interesting thing here is that there are two, we had to ask them, how long does it take you to rebuild this Gabion box structure after it's washed out? Well, it takes sometimes about 12 days and sometimes about 20 days. So those are kind of two different, qualitatively different kinds of shocks. And it turns out that in the 12 day or 14 day rebuild period, the 12 hour works really well. We're still struggling to figure out when 24 hour works well. And it turns out that 24 hour works well in the following sense. If you have a washout that takes 18 to 20 days to repair, nobody's going it's, to, it's hopeless. It's, it's, everybody's going to lose everything except one region from one to six. Now, if you're in a group of people who live together for a long time, you've got a second order problem to solve. Who gets to win this year? Well, it turns out that a 24, it's very difficult to predict with a 24 hour rotation who's going to win and who's going to win depends on who starts. So what they do is they draw straws to see who starts first. So they diffuse that tension of inequality using uncertainty. It's just a beautiful system that is adaptive in multiple levels of shocks and for two or three different kinds of problems. How is this thing fragile? Here's how. So again, this one's a stretch. It's metaphorical. Uh, I can't prove anything to you here. <coughs> but um, it's... Uh, very powerful, it can reduce, it can reduce uh, uh, sensitivity to all sorts of different variations. But let's go back to this picture. In this north, the, the reason I pointed out that this is a north-south steep system early on is because if you look at these systems, and I don't have a lot of great pictures, let me just, let me just do this. You see this uh, hill up back here? These are steep hills and up, up a little further is going to be the next irrigator. So that when you're actually delivering water, when Carl's doing his field, I'm standing just down below watching, ready to do mine when he's finished, which guess, guess what allows me to do? Well, then I can monitor him. It's very hard for him to take more water than he gets. Then it's my turn, okay? I mentioned these east-west systems. Some of the canals in those systems can be 40 miles long, as was the case in the Holcom culture in the Phoenix Basin. I can't watch you take your water anymore. We've got to come up with something else to monitor each other. So there's this super tight connection between the biophysical, uh, the resource itself, and the public infrastructure. So that arrow is really, really strong. Okay? Also, the public infrastructure in this case is the, is the irrigation canal itself, and the rules they use to, to manage that has a super strong influence on this relationship between the irrigators, who are also the public infrastructure providers in this case, Strong relationship between the irrigators and the resource. Here the resource is water. Okay, the public infrastructure is the irrigation system. Your case, electron flow is the resource, and public infrastructure is all that other stuff you're talking about. <clears throat> Turns out that this link is really weak in the sense that the resource users aren't actually very good at formal public infrastructure provision. And they really don't, you don't need a formal public infrastructure provision sector to provide the public infrastructure so you can lop this side off. So what that means is, is they're not very good at solving other kinds of collective action dilemmas like conflict resolution. So what do the development agencies do? They go in and say, hey, we want, to, we want you to, you know, decentralized uh, development. We're just going to give you some money. They're very fragile to those kinds of interventions. Causes conflict, what's called local elite co-option of the resources. So if you're not wise to these fragilities and you go in as a development 
a corporation or a development entity, an NGO, um, ouch. And that has been the experience with development efforts. From the 1950s to about the 1980s, most development efforts focused on building big canals, right? Really good, you know, we'll go in and give them good infrastructure, but they forgot to realize that these guys tune their infrastructure, they have earthen canals, so sometimes if water flows too low, they'll, they'll cut across canals briefly and then patch it back up with dirt, and it's very flexible. You go in and do a cement lining, and they just go, we can't use this. So there are fragilities all over the place, uh, and understanding those fragilities, I think, is really important as we think ahead with our development efforts. Next example. This is a picture of a shrimp boat, I think. I got this off Wikimedia Commons. I have to leave the guy here or uh, whomever with the link to this photo. Uh, it's in my book here. I didn't get it up here. But, um, wow. I was just at a meeting at Oregon State University. Uh, I'm a part of a team studying um, subarctic fisheries now. How many of you think fisheries are in good shape? So I wonder if I asked that question in a in a lay audience, they'd say, oh yeah, you know, things seem fine. Fish, you know, fish isn't that expensive. I can get reasons. Lobster's cheap. Lobster's booming, right? You know, lobster's booming. Uh, but you get a lot of different answers, and I'll throw a couple of big sums out for you, which I think are really interesting. I don't have as good a command of this as I do of the irrigation stuff, so when you leave here, don't quote me. But I think this is roughly order of magnitude. And it's an exemplar case, exactly. Um, <clears throat> some say that uh, a small percentage of the fisheries that are actually fished, we know anything about. I'm going to guess somewhere less than 40% of all fisheries are commercial fisheries. We don't, and, and we have some control over those. S more than 50%, I don't know how much more, are small artisanal fisheries like the irrigation system I showed you, that again, provide protein for at least a couple billion people. And we don't even know what they're fishing and we don't know the state of the fisheries. So uh, try to emphasize again that this is by no means a solved problem. There's a wonderful book that's coming out by Kevin Bailey. He worked uh, for NOAA for many years and was an observer on large uh, catcher processor boats in the Bering Sea. The Pollock fishery in the Bering Sea in Alaska is well-managed and extremely lucrative, and the book is called Billion Dollar Fish, where he describes the historical context for why that is. So any fish that you eat, people who are my age or older, when you were young, you'd be eating cod. You know, breaded fish would have been cod. Today it is pollock. So it's the sequential depletion of these fisheries that no one knows about. Again, it's this issue of average versus spatially explicit depletion. What we did is a different problem, and it's much more a mathematical exercise, where we said, well, look, suppose that you actually knew quite a bit about the fishery. You knew enough to write down a mathematical model, and you wanted to act as though you were the, the baron of fisheries, and you could control the fisheries uh, effort. In even those best conditions, could you be robust to uncertainty? That was our question here. So what we did, again, you have this fishery stock. So in a scientifically managed fishery, the, the complex dynamical system is the fishery, which are extraordinarily complex, and we find out that they're more complex every year. You have a scientist come out and do a stock assessment. Based on that stock assessment, a total allowable catch, a TAC, is established. And then depending on the property rights regime, that TAC is allocated either as a percentage or some quota to the fishers. And that's done every year. So it's a very clear feedback dynamic. Okay? Suppose mathematically that we have a model that looks like this. And, I, and I've written delta x of t here to just be amorphous about whether it's discrete time or continuous time. Uh, I just want to say that the change in the stock x is some function of the stock itself and two parameters, the growth rate and the carrying capacity. And if any of you have looked at these simple biological models, that is the simplest biolo biologically meaningful model for a biological population. And you have a harvest that depends on these four parameters, your technology, price, cost of effort, and your discount rate. And your change in effort is some function of how much stock there is and what the present effort is. 
That's very general. That's, that's probably the most general characterization of this problem you could possibly give. So let's just assume, in fact, that delta is continuous time, and we suppose that we know that this growth function is logistic. So logistic just means when their population is small, there aren't very many fish to reproduce. Finding a mate is hard, so the growth rate is low. You get more and more population, the growth rate goes up, and then as you po the population grows, there's some other limiting factor, competition for resources goes down again. So it's just a hump. Very simple, and again, that's a, a very simple, biologically reasonable um, representation of this fishery. And let's assume that we have a linear, so-called linear harvest function, where the amount of fish that you harvest is like a mass action principle of how good you are at catching fish, Q, times the effort, which is sort of the number of boats times the days they fish, times the stock size. So this assumes, again, that the stock's all well mixed and you're just scooping them out like with a soup strainer, right? It's not a very good model, but we thought, hey, great place to start because everyone who works in fisheries knows exactly what this model's about. You don't know or can't measure these guys perfectly. So we wanted to say, what can you do? What's the best thing to do if you don't know the growth rate? Most fishery science scientists don't know the growth rate. They don't know what the carrying capacity is. They don't know what the maximum stock size is. Go ask a fishery scientist, who are all excellent scientists, you say, well, what's the carrying capacity for the pollock fishery? And they go, well, that's a silly question. Right, it's complex, you know, what time, so on and so forth. What, what substock are you talking about? What's, you know, they'd ask you a lot of questions. What's the price of the, the output? Lobster prices now are killing lobstermen. Even though they're very productive, they have controlled the system, the stock is high, and they're catching a lot of lobster, especially the Nova Scotian lobster fishery. Prices are dropping because there's too much lobster on the market and the timing for the lobster market, when they catch, when they sell. A lot of market complexities. No way you're going to measure that. No one knows how good these guys are. The minute you try to tell a fisherman how to do something, he or she will change and they'll get better. We don't know that, and we absolutely don't know their opportunity costs. We don't know what their time and effort and capital are worth in some other occupation. So you start to see when you deconstruct the model, you kind of go, why did we ever write this model down in the first place, really? But it is a good conceptual place to start, and it has been used very powerfully to make points about how we should think about things. So it, it's a reasonable model to uh, play around with. Delta's discount rates, of course, that's going to change based on what alternative investments are available to you. Because your discount rate is really a measure of what, else, what other investments out there that you can invest in. Finally, what, when you show up, what is the initial condition of the stock? So that's X0. Most of the time when you show up as a fishery manager, you don't show up to a pristine stock. You show up to one that's in trouble. You don't know how in trouble it is. So we said, you're the fisher. Uh, sorry, you're the fishery <coughs> manager. If you have perfect control, in other words, every, what you say is done, what can you do here? Um, if there's no uncertainty, you want to maximize the net value of future harvesting activity for society. Right? We were chatting a little bit last night about how crazy that is. These, we have essentially given the uh, Arctic Pollock fishery, the subarctic Pollock fishery, to about 20 guys who are all multi-hundred millionaires. That's the fishery of the United States. Why wouldn't we charge a royalty just like we do for oil companies? Of course, it's way too low, but you kind of scratch your head and say, well, wait, what? Well, well, that's my Paula too, right? No uncertainty. The objective is to maximize the net value. Maximize if you, d if you take all the future income from fishing and get the net present value, we want to maximize that for society. That's my object objective if I know what I'm doing. But uncertainty is the same game, but you want to minimize the worst case loss of being wrong. So we're going to look at this one. This one's done. This has been done 100 million times in 100 million slight variations of this problem. So we all know that well. This one has uh, been done a few times with what I consider probably inappropriate methods. How much of this do I want to show you? Not a lot, but it, here's, here's, a, here's a two feedback systems. The inner feedback system is the fisher. He's going to make choices based on all those parameters. The outer feedback loop is you is trying to play with the system to control what that fisher is going to do. We're going to say that we can peel this out because the fishers obey us. So here's the optimal perfect knowledge case. And I'm only going to talk about the blue one because the red one's sort of irrelevant. If I show up and the fish stock is less than the optimal, I, I keep all the boats in the dock and I wait until the stock recovers to the optimal long run stock and then let them fish. Okay? Very simple. Called a bang bang solution because the objective function here is linear. You know, it's, you know, if, you're, if you ask where the 
high and low point of a line is, it's always at the edges, right? You either do nothing or you, you're full on. Just for um, c contrast, if you show up to a pristine fishery, you fish it as hard as you can and then turn the fishery off and then hold it at the long run optimal. And that long run optimal balance essentially balances the value of your effort against the, the investment value of the capital that you generate by fishing. Okay, what we did is we, uh, we looked at lots of alternatives, and I'm not going to go through a lot of these, but suppose, on the other hand, these are some of the different policies that we tried. We just did a sweep of all kinds of different policies. Suppose that you, uh, you let fishers fish early and you kind of slowly approach this, not bang, bang, or you, you kind of, the, the dotted line here is the optimal, you kind of wait even longer than the optimal, you're conservative, you say let's let the fishery recover even more and then we'll slowly, you know, we'll slowly bring in the boats. And then of course this is what happens to the stock. So in the purple one you wait, you see, let's compare this to sh sh here you, the optimal is the black here. If you wait, you let the stock recover a lot and then you slowly fish it down. Anybody would think, gut, in a gut feeling, well that's a little more robust in case you're wrong, you're being a little conservative, right? The uh, un, uh, precautionary principle. But we looked at all these different things to try to understand how they perform under different types of uncertainty. We didn't know. There's no way of knowing. You have, just have to do the calculations. There's really no way to know. So this is what we ended up learning. So what we plotted, it, this is the sensitivity of your, your value of the fishery. Okay? This is the sensitivity of the value of the fishery versus the, um, the value itself. These are different strategies. So right here, this is the optimal. Obviously, the optimal is the one where you, the, the total value is the highest. Okay? The same thing here. This is the sensitivity with respect to not knowing the carrying capacity, the size of the fishery. This is the sensitivity to not knowing so well or perfectly the cost of effort. So if you want to become robust to not knowing this, i.e. reduce your sensitivity, you want to choose these BC family policies down here. So you can reduce your sensitivity pretty, you know, quite a bit by 50% if you move down here. Of course, you give up performance. Anybody who has a retirement account knows this, right? Risk, rate of return. You always have to give up performance to be robust. But notice here, you also have, I mean, what's the first thing that pops out here? These guys are flipped. So becoming, choosing policies to become robust to not knowing the size of the fishery is going to make you very sensitive to not knowing the cost, the opportunity cost. So you're trading off biological robustness to, for sensitivity in the livelihoods of the fishers themselves. See, so it, there's this fundamental trade-off that we can reveal with this um, simple modeling. Now, this, I, I don't mean you to actually see this, but this is a picture of all these different, we, we generated all these different pictures for different cases and tried to gather up our knowledge of what was, what was robust to what. It turns out that you can then get pretty strong patterns of correlated robustness. So this is cost and price, of course they go together. If you become robust to cost, you're going to be robust to price as well. These go in the opposite directions like I just showed you. This one is, uh, this one's price and this one's carrying capacity. There's a strong trade-off here, right? There's a trade-off frontier here. And then I just want to illustrate here that, well, I wish it all were like this because then I can make, this is a science paper kind of data. This is field journal paper. It's, it's kind of messy. But we, uh, I think we were able to generate some pretty powerful patterns, and these are the patterns. The sensitivities for price, cost, and Q, what I would call socioeconomic par parameters, they vary directly. So you can, in, in other words, if you become robust to one, you get the other ones for free. And that's great, because the less you know about, the less you have to know about your system, the better. Uh, but they vary inversely with what you might call the biological parameters. The growth rate, the carrying capacity, the initial condition, and delta. Calling, calling the discount rate biophysical is a little sketchy, but it's so tied up with how the biophysical system operates versus alternative investments. We, kind of, we didn't know where to put it, so we put it in that context. Uh, and this is my colleagues, my colleague from electrical engineering who always wants to put in these statements about there are appreciable discrepancies with these other ones, which I appreciate. As a mathematician, we kind of we like the general results and we move on. Okay, sensitivities for the other ones vary directly with one another inversely. So there's a direct trade-off with these clusters of parameters. We didn't try to find this, this just came out. 
which we th thought is very interesting. So there's a big, big message here. If you become robust to biological uncertainty, you become fragile to economic uncertainty and vice versa, which I think is a pretty powerful story. Of course, we're working very hard on this still. It's just hard work and slow. <coughs> Some very general thoughts. I mentioned Bode's law. That's that fundamental trade-off. Uh, Bode worked with linear systems, and he proved rigorously that there is a conservation law. Like if you integrate over all frequencies the log of sensitivity, you get some number. It's conserved for linear systems. These are highly nonlinear systems. There's no proof that I know of, but it's, it's some evidence that Bode's law extends beyond the linear time invariant case. You can't be robust to everything. You're going to face trade-offs. They're interesting groupings. Um, and we tried, to, uh, we tried to give some sense of um, how you might use this. And I think it's relevant to the energy case that we heard about earlier. And that is as follows. Depending on how much you know, you can then decide where it's most important that you learn and where it's most important that you become or remain robust. So what you do is you match robustness and vulnerability knowledge to domains given some cost-benefit analysis. So uh, if, if your parameter groupings map nicely into these different domains like ours, ha like ours have, you could say, well, we, uh, because our, if we choose these policies, we are robust to those parameters, so let's not waste time learning about those, right? Because you, your, your policies are robust to uncertainty about those parameters. Then you focus your learning activities on knowing more about the ones that you're most sensitive to, right? Uh, I won't talk about mode two. It's, it's uh, beyond, beyond the interest of our, this group here. All right. Um, both cases here, looking at two different cases, uh, I've kind of highlighted these performance, robustness, robustness, vulnerability trade-offs. In some sense, it, it seems to me that there are two sides of the same coin in that sometimes uh, in, in my group of colleagues, we, we often talk about those cases where you actually want to in, in, increase fragilities in a system. So in the energy system, we may want to, I mean, we're in a really robust attractor here with fossil fuels. Can we think of policies or ways to make that domain of attraction more fragile to be able to flip it into something else? So this kind of analysis goes uh, both ways. Um, oops, I wanted to show you one more thing. I don't even know if this will work. But um, it, at ASU, we've spent a huge amount of time. Oh, this isn't on me. I don't know if I did something that's a security. OK, so you're not on the internet. Um, no matter, but uh, we've spent a lot of effort at um, ASU to build a database, and uh, if you're interested, I can leave the, you can just Google, Google my name and you'll get there, but it's a collection of uh, about 80 case studies from around the world that Lynn Ostrom used to write her book, uh, Governing the Commons, which I think is the reason she won the Nobel Prize, uh, a beautiful piece of work, to look at each one in detail and then try to classify these systems into these classes of robust and fragile systems with the objective being as global change, notice I didn't say climate, I stopped myself, as global change involving social, economic and biophysical change uh, evolves, these small scale systems are going to be perturbed in all sorts of uh, ways. I think we have to be prepared to at least have a conversation about trying to help them not be too impacted by what we do. So finally. Um, thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, I just want to thank my collaborators here on this work, and I'm very uh, happy to try to answer your questions. <laughs>